we want to discuss the fourth topic in our corporate governance class. The fourth topic is on the board of directors. The board of directors. I want to say that um, when you talk of the board of directors, my name is Mr. Richard. I will take you through the board of directors. Now, the board of directors is a very, very important topic in the corporate governance class. Why? What is the reason? It's because that our exam is basically based on the board of directors. Corporate governance class topic one, or the first question is a narrative question where you are given a case study. And from the case study, then you are told to derive some uh, answers or some of the issues that have been highlighted in that um, question. One of the most important things that we must be tested in that question one is the topic of board of directors. Why? Because in our introduction class, we discussed and said that corporate governance refers to the systems and structures through which an organization is directed and controlled. Structures through which an organization is directed and controlled. Meaning that when you talk of the board of directors, what are board of directors? They are basically the entity they refer to the entity or the persons that manage the affairs of an organization. So these board of directors, they form the basis of our corporate governance class because everything that we have been discussing from what is corporate governance to what are the principles of corporate governance, if you can remember the principles of corporate governance, one of it is the balance of power. What have we been saying in the balance of power? We have been saying that balance of power refers to a situation where we have the composition of the board. So one of the principles that we will be focusing on, the main principles of corporate governance that we will be focusing on in this topic, the principles of uh, corporate governance that we will be focusing on is one, the balance of power. The first one is the balance of power. So when we will be talking of this concept of the board of directors, I will tell you when we will start to write. So this one I want to explain so that uh, everybody can understand what we'll be focusing on when we talk of the board of directors. I want to form the basis from the introduction class on the principles of corporate governance. So we are saying the balance of power. One of the principles is the balance of power. What, are the, what does the principle, a principle of balance of power tell us? That for a board of directors or the composition of the board of directors should consist of both the executive and an executive directors. Both the executive and non-executive directors. So that is one of the things that we'll be checking on the composition. When we'll be talking of the composition of the board of directors of a company, then we must check, is that board consisting of both the executive and non-executive directors? We will again talk of what is the meaning of executive director, directors, basically the directors that are involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization. While the non-executive directors the non-executive directors, they refer to the directors who are not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the organization. So we will be checking on the board of directors, is there a balance of power? What are some of the elements of balance of power that we will be checking in the, in the topic of board of directors? The executive and an executive directors. And we say that for the non-executive directors, at least a third, at least a third of the board of directors must be non-executive directors. They must be non-executive directors. So anytime you are given a case study, 
you are given a case study on the topic of board of directors in that question one, one of the things that you must check, do th does the composition of the non-executive directors, is it a third of the total of the board of directors? The other element that we have under the balance of power that is very important under the board of directors is the role of the chairperson, the role of the chairperson and the CEO. The role of the chairperson and the CEO should be different, should be different and carried by different persons and carried by different persons. So as we will be checking, and as you also go through the first papers, when you see any matter concerning the board of directors, you have to check. Richard, a director of PAP College, is both a chair and a CEO. What are some of the board inefficiencies that you have identified from that organization structure? One, lack of balance of power. Why? It is because the role of the chairperson and the CEO, they are being carried out by the same person. So that is what we are saying, that the role of the chairperson and the CEO should be different persons. Another thing that on the balance of power that we will be discussing, or one of the best practices when you talk of the board of directors is that the board should have committees. They should have committees. That is another important thing. When you talk of the board of directors, this entity that is managing the affairs of an organization, it must have some committees. So as you'll be reading the narrative in that question one, that the board operated wholly, they did not have any person, they did not have any committees, then you will see that there is lack of balance of power because the balance of power ensures that there is accountability and transparency in the organization. We will have the four main committees. And I want to tell you that this board of directors, they form the basis of what we learn in the advanced level. So any person who is at the advanced level must know well the topic of board of directors. Because at the advanced level, we have the boardroom dynamics, focusing on the board of directors. We will also talk of strategic management, focusing on the board of directors. So board of directors form the basis of the advanced level CS. So the, they have committees. Which are the four main committees? You must ensure before you go to that exam room, they are must, you must know, you must know the following roles and functions of the following committees. One is the nominating, nomination committee, nomination committee. The second one is the audit committee, audit committee, the third one, remuneration committee, remuneration committee, the fourth one, risk, risk committee, risk committee. This form the four main committees that an organization should ensure that it has. The nomination committee, audit committee, remuneration committee and a risk committee. As you will, and as you go more on the corporate governance, there is the aspect of succession planning. So another committee that is closely linked to these committees is a succession planning committee. So there's that succession planning committee that you need uh, to know more about it. Then after that, the other, uh, the other principle of corporate governance that we will focus on on the board of directors is what we call the appointment. Appointment of members of the board. Appointment of members of the board. Appointment of members of the board. We shall say, that the principles of corporate governance dictate that the process of appointing members of the board should be fair, transparent, and rigorous. Fair, 
transparent and rigorous to ensure to ensure only competent persons are appointed. So that is the other principle that we will focus on in this topic of uh, corporate governance or this topic of board of directors, the appointment of members to the board. So anytime you go to that question, question one, you are told that the process of appointing members of the board Richard took his uh, friend from the classic dropout and he appointed him to be one of the non-executive directors. Then obviously one of the non, um, or one of the board inefficiencies that you must talk is the appointment procedure. The appointment should be very transparent and it should be fair to only appoint competent persons. The other principle that is closely linked to this appointment is what we call the board mix of skills, mix of skills and competence of the board. Mix of skills and competence of the board. That is another feature that you need to have. Mix of skills and competence of the board. Another principle of corporate governance that the board itself, it should consist of a variety of skills. That is what, when we go to the boardroom dynamics, we call the concept of diversity, board diversity. Board diversity is the mix of skills. Where we say, what is board diversity? It refers to the distinguishing future, the distinguishing future that differentiates one employee from the other. The distinguishing feature that differentiates an employee from the other. For example, there is the age. So the board may be consisting of old and young persons. The other one, we can talk of gender, both males and females. The other one, culture, people from different cultures, so those are some of the things that we check, the mix of skills. Does the board only have competent persons? What is competent? Their only persons are their person that have the requisite skills required. So if there is any person who was a form four dropout, any person who is a class eight dropout, then we can say that those persons, they lack or that board lacks the mix of skills and competence of the board, the mix of skills and competence of the board. So those are some of the um, features that we must check, that we must check when we will uh, be discussing. The three main principles, okay, there are others that are also the principles of corporate governance, the principle of internal control systems, where we say that internal control systems is where you ensure that uh, the organization achieves its objective in an efficient and effective manner. So I want to say that anytime, it, when you'll be through with this topic of board of directors, then try as much as possible to try to answer question one of the past papers of corporate governance, because the topic board of directors always forms the topic question one. And it is a topic that we never miss in your past papers because it forms the basis of all of us who are taking CS and also forms the basis of what we discuss at the advanced level. So we can start by saying, what is the meaning of board of directors? We can start by saying, now we can write board of directors. The board of directors. We can start by saying that board of directors refers to a body elected or appointed by the refers to a body elected or appointed by members 
of an organization by members of an organization to manage the affairs of that organization, to manage the affairs of that organization, to manage the affairs of that organization. That is the meaning of the term board of directors. You can also say that board of directors refers to, that one you can also say that board of directors refers to a group of individuals tasked, a group of individuals tasked with overseeing the performance, a group of individuals tasked with overseeing the performance of activities of the organization, group of individuals, tasked with overseeing the performance of activities of the organization. Question. Question. Outline the best practices. Outline the best practices. The best practices of the board of directors. Outline the best practices of the board of directors. Outline the best practices of the board of directors. The best practices of the board of directors. I want to say, anytime you see the word best practices, the term best practices, we normally alternate it with the word or what are some of the standards that have been put in place to measure the standards that have been put in place to measure the efficiency of the organization. So the best practices in relation to the board of directors, they are the standards of corporate governance that have been put in place that measures the effectiveness, that measures the effectiveness of the board of directors. One, the organization should have competent and ethical persons. The organization, the organization should only hire, should only hire competent and ethical persons, competent and ethical persons. I've said that competent means that that person is an expert in a certain area. He has some requisite, actually not even an expert, he has the requisite skills needed for you to be appointed as a member. Who are the persons that appoint these members? The, the persons that appoint those members, they are known as the, uh, or the persons that appoint the board of directors are the members or what we call the shareholders. One of the topics that uh, in corporate governance is the, on the shareholders. We shall say that the shareholders appoint the directors on the recommendation of the nomination committee. So the shareholders should only hire, they should only assign the role of board of directors to competent and ethical persons, competent and ethical persons. The other one, the board should have a succession policy. The board should have a succession policy. The board should have a succession policy, should have a succession policy. What are we saying? You will find that narrative that uh, the CEO of the company, Mr. Richard, uh, resigned from his job. And then what happened? There were some conflicts. There were some conflicts between the board of directors that remained in that organization. So what, and actually it was in the April, if you check the April 2022 question one, if not the April 2022, the August, one of them, they were focusing on this best practice, that the board should have a succession policy. What is succession? 
that the board have put in place measures that in case of any of the senior members leaves the organization or the seat of those senior members falls vacant, then there is a person who can replace the persons that can replace that individual. There's a person that can replace that individual. So that is what we are saying, a succession policy. The board should have a succession policy. Please make, uh, before even we reach at that point, try to understand what is the advantage, advantages of succession, planning, advantages of succession planning, because I've said that succession planning, you are determining ahead of time, persons that can fill in the place or the office of a director in case it falls vacant. That is what we call the succession policy or the succession planning. One of it, try to understand what is the advantages of that succession planning, what are some of the limitations that happen there? Because in that question in the April 2022 or the August, one of it, the examiner was asking on the advantages and then the limitations, or what are some of the criticisms on this or challenges of this succession challenges? And then the last one is what are the functions, functions or the roles, the roles of succession committee, the succession committee. So anytime you are, you are going through the question one and you cannot see the board should having a succession policy, then that is one of the board inefficiencies that you must highlight. Then the other one is the board size. The board size. The other best practice that you have to check is the board size. The board size. We can say, we can write and say that in matters concerning the board size, one can say that the board should be of optimum size. The board should be, the board should be of optimum optimum size. Some books will tell you that the board should be of sufficient size. Sufficient size. That is, we can say that is, that is, the board should not be too large. The board should not be too large. To prevent serious discussions, that is, the board should not be too large to prevent discussions. And it should not be too small. And it should not be too small. It should not be too small. Such that it excludes. It should not be too small such that it excludes expertise, such that it excludes expertise and skills, such that it ex excludes the expertise and skills or limits discussion or limits discussion board size of sufficient size. It should not be too large to prevent serious discussions and it should not be too small to limit the expertise and skills in that organization. I want to give a question, you can try it. It was in one of the boardroom dynamics at the advanced level, please try to answer it. What are the outline, the factors considered the factors considered when determining, when determining board size. Five marks. It was in the boardroom dynamics. 
to be on the safe side, you can also try to tell us what is then, what are some of the factors that you use to consider the size of the board? The other one, the other one, board composition. The other best practices on the board composition, the board composition, board composition, the board composition. board composition where we can say for the board composition we can say that the board should consist of both the executive and an executive directors the board should consist of both the executive and non-executive directors the board should consist of both the executive and non-executive directors. That is what I have said. That is what I have said. When you talk of board composition, the executive and an executive directors, at least at that of the board of directors, should be non-executive directors. At least at that of the directors should be non-executive directors i want you i want you at your free time but you can just basically talk of it so we are saying that the board should have should consist should consist of both the executive and non-executive directors. We have said that executive directors, they are directors that are involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization. What are some of the questions that we can get from this point? One, one, we can get, identify, identify the roles, the roles of non-executive directors, the roles of non-executive directors. In one of the past papers, the examiner has asked you, justify the reasons for non-executive directors. Justify the reasons for non-executive directors. In other words, the examiner in that question is just basically asking you, what are some of the roles of a, a non-executive director in an organization? What are some of the roles of non-executive director in an organization? So one, we can say they provide a clearer and wider view. You can write and say that for the, we can just try to answer that question on what are some of the roles of these non-executive directors. Non-executive directors are also known as the independent directors. So if you go through the past paper and you see the word independent, so these ones, they are also known as the independent directors. Independent directors. They are also known as the outside directors. They are also known as the outside directors. So what are some of the roles? One, they provide a clearer and wider view. They provide a clearer and wider view of the affairs affecting the organization. They provide a clearer and wider view of the affairs affecting the organization. Provide a clearer and wider view of the affairs affecting the organization. The other one, they monitor the performance of executive. They monitor the performance of the executive directors. They monitor the performance of the executive directors in relation to the performance of the organization. They monitor the performance of the executive directors in relation to performance of the organization or performance of organization's objective. 
in relation to performance of the organization's objective. The other one, they determine the appropriate levels of remuneration. They determine the appropriate levels of remuneration, appropriate determine, appropriate levels of remuneration. They determine the appropriate levels of remuneration. of executive directors, of executive directors. They determine the appropriate levels of remuneration of executive directors. Also, we can say they connect the business and uh, the organization and the board they connect the organization and the board. They connect the organization and the board with potentially useful people. They connect the organization and the board with potentially useful people. They connect the organization and the board with potentially useful people. with potentially useful people. They connect the board with potentially useful people. Then another one. We can say, um, Another function we can say, they provide necessary checks and balance. 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 To ensure, to ensure that the interest of the minority shareholders, to ensure that the interest of the minority shareholders, to ensure that the interest of the minority shareholders and the general public, and the general public. and the general public are considered and the general public are considered when the organization is making decisions when the organization is making decisions when the organization is making decisions so those are some of the roles, the roles of non-executive directors, very important and very common. Now, a very common question is what will be asked as outline. This one I want to give as an assignment, you can try and answer it. Outline the attributes, the attributes or what you call the characteristics characteristics of non-executive directors, non-executive directors. Five marks, 
or what are some of the essential qualities that you must have for you to be appointed as a non-executive director? As a non-executive director. So that is the, um, so that was on the board composition. The other best practice, the other best practice that we must talk of is one, the chairperson of the board should be a non-executive director. The chairperson of the board. So one of the best practices, we are back to the fifth one, the chairperson of the board should be a non-executive director. Should be a non-executive director should be a non-executive director. The chairperson of the board should be a non-executive director. What do you mean? Why are we saying that uh, the chairperson must be a non-executive director? It is because for a chairperson, for a chairperson to be a non-executive director, when you'll be going through this assignment, you will see that one of the characteristics of a non-executive director is that he should not have, a non-executive director should not have any conflict of interest. That is why we are saying that one of the roles of non-executive director is to provide a clearer and wider view of the affairs affecting the organization. Because one of the characteristics for you to be appointed as a non-executive director is that you should not have any conflict of interest in the running of the organization. You should not have any conflict of interest. So the chairperson of the board should be a non-executive director to ensure that he does not have a conflict of interest and he can provide a wider view on all the affairs that are affecting the organization. You can also talk of the board should have diversity. 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 In your past papers, in May 2017, question one, the board should have, okay, the board, the last one we can talk of, the board should have diversity. They should have diversity. Where I have said for the diversity, it means mix of skills, the mix of skills and competence. People should come from different professional fields. They should come from different professional fields in, such, in a board. What do you think are some of the advantages of a mix of skills and competence? The advantages of this, the mix of skills and competence, one is that it helps to prevent, helps to prevent outsourcing of services, prevent outsourcing of services. That these people, the board consists of lawyers, the board consists of teachers, the board consists of medicals. So you don't have to outsource to get services from another person. It is a compliance requirement. It is a compliance requirement. The third one, we can say that one of the other reasons that uh, you need mix of skills and competence is that improved decision making in an organization, improved decision making. Also, you can say that it enhances independent judgment, enhances independent judgment. ETC. Now, from that, from that, I want us to go to uh, May 2017, question one, where the examiner asked, outline the functions or the roles of the board. 
what are the functions or the roles of a board? Outline the functions or the roles of a board. That the functions or the roles of a board. This entity that manages the affairs of an organization, what are the uh, roles collectively? So the roles outline the functions and the word, the examiner can use the word functions, the examiner can use the roles of the board. Board of directors. What are some of the roles of board of directors collectively? Before we go to the different types of directors, what are the roles of the board collectively? One, we can say, determine the organization mission, vision, and core values. Determine the organization. Determine the organization's mission vision and core values. When you go to the strategic management at the advanced level, we shall say that an organization's mission, mission is the purpose for which an organization was formed. The purpose or the reasons why we formed that organization is known as a mission. Vision, they are the future aspirations the future aspirations or the future goals of an organization are known as a vision. And then the core values are what we call the value or the, what are some of the values that uh, guide the organization? Then the other one, they exercise leadership, integrity, exercise leadership, exercise leadership integrity when directing the organization to achieve its objective to achieve its objective to achieve its objective the other one we can say that they exercise their roles collectively and not individually. Exercise their roles collectively and not individually. So you will be checking in that question one, the narrative question, were this board operating as a team? Because collectively means they are operating as a team or somebody was trying to divert the attention of the others. Somebody was making decisions while the others did not know that decision. So that is one of the things that you should check. The other one, ensure that the organization complies with all relevant laws and regulations. Ensure that the organization complies ensure that the organization complies with all relevant, ensure that the organization complies with all relevant laws, with all the relevant laws and regulations, with all the relevant laws and regulations governing the industry, governing the industry in which the organization operates, in which the organization operates, in which the organization operates. The other one, the other one we can say, they ensure availability of adequate resources. Ensure availability of adequate resources. Ensure availability of 
adequate resources of adequate resources for the achievement of the organization objective for the achievement of the organization's objective for the achievement of the organization's objective another one another role we can say that it monitors the organization performance monitors organization performance monitors the organization's performance monitors the organization performance and ensure sustainability monitors organization performance monitors organization's performance and ensure sustainability and ensure sustainability sustainability is one of the principles of corporate governance one of the principles of corporate governance is sustainability what do you mean by the sustainability sustainability when you talk of sustainability it means that the organization while making their decisions they should not compromise the future of the organization they should not compromise they should not compromise the decisions of the future generations that is a very important element when you read that uh, narrative as a question and you see that the uh, the board of directors were in haste they were focusing on the short term returns that eventually led to the collapse of the organization what are some of the principles that you have governed the principle of lack of sustainability in the decision making by that board so the sustainability as we achieve the organization performance as we achieve the organization objective we must ensure that there is sustainability so sustainability is the aspect of uh, as you make the organization's decision you should not compromise the future generations then also they approve the organization structure approve they approve organization structure organization structure and ensure effective communication and ensure effective communication with the shareholders with the shareholders and stakeholders with the shareholders and the stakeholders approve organization structure one of the topics in the strategic management is the topic organization structure what is the meaning of an organization structure it is refers to the arrangement of an organization the arrangement of an organization is known as organization structure meaning is it a hierarchical organization structure where we value the levels of powers in an organization is it a flat organization structure that has reduced bureaucracy is it a matrix organization structure that brings different types of structures together for example the functional and product structures is it a divisional structure so they approve that is the work of the board of directors to approve the organization structure and ensure effective communication so also one of the things that we'll check in that question one if you're asked is there effective communication with the shareholders and stakeholders because we always say that one of the rights of the shareholders is that to receive to receive information on all the essential activities happening in an organization so what if you are reading a case study and then you see that 
for the board of directors, they did not even inform the shareholders of the decisions that they were making. The shareholders came to notice uh, those decisions after the act has been done. So what are some of the board inefficiencies? Lack of effective communication or lack of transparent and effective communication between the organization and the shareholders. You can lastly talk of the last one. You can say that the last uh, function is to approve the annual budget of the organization, to approve the annual budget of the organization, to approve the annual budget of the organization, to approve the annual budget of the organization. Uh, then, then from that, we can ask ourselves, what are the different types of directors? We are first focused on the aspect of uh, the board as a whole. So before we continue on what is the appointment, composition, what is evaluation and everything, we need to know who are these persons that consist uh, this board of directors. They are the different type of directors. So before we continue on the appointment, composition, and the committees, then it is important for us to first discuss what are the different types of directors in an organization, different types of directors in an organization. So the types of directors, that is what we study in uh, company law. Company law, we, the topic of directors, we ask ourselves the different types of directors in an organization. When we study the types of directors, we also ask ourselves, what are the different qualifications for you to be appointed as a director? And then what is the other thing? Disqualifications for you to be appointed as a director. And then what are the either the statutory duties or the common law duties? So we first discuss subtopic type of directors. We need to understand these persons who work in these, uh, or these persons that consist of these boards, what are the different types of directors? Types of directors. Type of directors. When you talk of the type of directors, you can have the first one, executive directors. Executive directors where we can say for the executive directors, they are directors involved in the day-to-day -day management of the organization, directors involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization, the day-to-day -day running of the organization, The other one, the other one, we can say non-executive directors, we want to, the other one is non-executive directors, the non-executive directors non-executive directors, the non-executive directors, also known as the independent directors, also known as the independent directors, they are directors not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the organization, directors not involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization, directors not involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization. The directors not involved, so they are inactive. They are inactive 
they are not involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization. The other one, we can talk of shadow directors. We have the third one, shadow directors. Shadow directors. Who are shadow directors? They are directors not involved in the day-to-day, -day, directors not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the organization, directors not involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization, but they influence, but they influence the decision-making process of the organization, but they influence the decision-making process of the organization, but they influence the decision-making process of the organization. They influence the decision-making process of the organization. The other one, alternate directors, alternate direct, uh, directors, alternate. alternate directors, the alternate directors. The alternate directors, where well, we can say they are the directors, alternate directors. They are directors. That represents they are the directors that represent the main directors. They are the directors that represent the main directors. In functions, the directors that represent the main directors in functions. So alternate means that they are uh, representatives of the directors. They are representative of the main directors. Representatives of the main directors, they are known as the alternate directors. The other one? Casual vacancy directors. 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 Where well, we can say they are directors that feel the position of a director or they fill the position of the office of director they are directors who fill the position of the office of director when it falls vacant the directors who fill the position of the office of the director when it falls vacant, when it falls vacant. So those are some of the types of directors that we can find in a company. It is in your past papers where the examiner has told you to explain different types of directors in an organization. So those are some of them that you can answer if you find that question. The other one is what are the qualifications for you to be appointed as a director? Qualifications to be appointed as a director. Qualification to be appointed as a director. What are the qualifications to be appointed as a director? qualifications to be appointed as a director. One, have a minimum age 
of at least 21 years have a minimum age of at least 21 years of at least 21 years the other one have sound mind you must have sound mind the other one you can say a person must not be bankrupt or insolvent a person must not be bankrupt or insolvent a person must not be bankrupt or insolvent a person must not be bankrupt person must not be bankrupt or insolvent the fourth one you can say a person must deliver to the registrar a written consent a person must deliver person must deliver to the registrar a written consent to act as a director to act as a director a written consent to act as a director Another should not be disqualified from being a director. Should not be disqualified from being a director by a competent court. Should not. The person should not. So you can say the person should not be disqualified should not be disqualified from being appointed or from being a director by a competent court from being a director by a competent court by a competent court then the other If the articles provides, if the articles provides, if the articles provide, if the articles provide, the directors should have the minimum qualification shares. The directors should have the minimum qualification shares should have the minimum qualification shares what is the minimum qualification shares what do you mean by this term minimum qualification shares initially when you were at the old syllabus when you were talking of um, corporate secretarial there was something that we used to say that a director may either be a de facto de facto or a de jure director a de facto or de jure director means that for a de facto he is a person that has been appointed as a director but he has been given some duration mostly two months to have acquired the minimum qualification shares so he has not met all the legal or all the qualifications required for one to be a director of a company that is a de facto which we used to, we used to say or it is actually there that in any acts by a de facto director then those acts are binding to the company they are binding so a de facto means that yes you have been appointed as a director but there are some requisites or there are some essentials that you have not met 
So that is what we call the de facto director. De jure is a director that has met all the requirements of a company. He has all uh, met the requisites or what are some of the conditions that have been placed for you to be appointed as a director. So minimum qualification in PAP college here, the minimum uh, qualification for you to be, or the minimum uh, shares for you to be appointed as a director is 5,000 shares. For you, you have 3,000. So it means that you have not met the qualification. So there is some standards. That is why you are talking of the articles. What is the meaning of articles? It is what we call the articles of association. In the next topic, the topic five in corporate governance, we talk of the internal corporate documents. One of the internal corporate documents that we'll discuss is the articles of association. Articles of association is the primary constitution of a company means it is one that regulates the relationship between the company and its own members, the articles. So it is the most uh, or the main constitution. It outlines the regulations of that company. So if the articles provide that you must have the qualification and shares, therefore for you to be appointed, then you must meet those qualification shares. You must meet those qualification shares. I want to read uh, a question, a question that is in one of your papers. Highlight six ways, a question in one of your papers. Highlight six ways, highlight six ways. Highlight six ways in which a director of a company may vacate office. Highlight six ways, it's in one of your past papers. Highlight six ways in which the director of a company may vacate office. Six ways in which the director of a company may vacate office. In other words, the examiner is asking you six ways. I lied six ways in which a director may vacate office. May vacate office. In other words, the examiner is asking you what are some of the disqualifications of a director? Disqualifications of a director. So this question can also be asked as the disqualifications, disqualifications of a director. Another way the examiner can ask you is what are some of the grounds for removal? Grounds for removal of a director from office grounds for removal of a director from office, all of those uh, subtopics, they are asking one and the same thing. The examiner is asking one and the same thing that requires the same, same answers. One, if the director is declared bankrupt, If the director is declared bankrupt, declared bankrupt, you can say if the person or if the director is becomes of unsound mind, director becomes of unsound mind. If the director becomes of unsound mind,
the third one if the director dies or in case of death of the bank uh, director death so this question you can also add that it is the circumstances under which the office of the director may fall vacant which are some of the circumstances where the office of the director may fall vacant if the director dies another one if the director is disqualified from holding office by a court of order by a competent court if the director is disqualified from holding office, from holding office by a competent court, by a competent court. The other one, if the director fails, if the director fails to acquire the minimum share qualifications, if the director fails to acquire, if the director fails to acquire the minimum qualification shares, qualification shares within the prescribed minimum, uh, within the prescribed within the prescribed duration within the prescribed duration and then another one if he resigns from office by a written notice if he resigns from office by a written notice if he resigns from office by a written notice. If he resigns from office by a written notice. The other one, we can say, if he absents himself, if he absents himself, you can write, if he absents himself, from director's meeting, if he absents himself from director's meeting, if he absents himself from director's meeting held over six months, if he absents himself from director's meeting held over six months, held over six months, and then we can also talk of if he is removed from office, if he is removed from office, if he is removed from office by ordinary resolution, if he is removed from office by ordinary resolution, by ordinary resolution at a general meeting if he's removed from office by ordinary resolution at a general meeting. If he's removed from office by ordinary resolution at a general meeting. What is ordinary resolution? A decision by a simple majority. When you, um, you go through the company directors in company law, that is why we talk of the procedure of removing a director from office and the last point we always talk of, by ordinary resolution, the members may resolve to remove a director from office. So then the other one is that where he attains, where he attains, where he attains, where he attains, where he attains an age of 70 years, where he attains the age of 70 years.
Question, in one of your past papers, uh, the examiner has asked, outline five matters, outline five matters reserved for a board meeting. 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 Which are some of the matters reserved for a board meeting? Matters reserved for a board meeting. Outline five matters reserved for a board meeting. Reserved for a board meeting. This is what we always say. The examiner can ask you, what are some of the powers, powers of the board of directors? Powers of the board of directors. The examiner can also call it that way. Powers of the board of directors. Or what are some of the uh, matters discussed in the board meeting? If you find a question asking you, matters reserved for a board meeting, what is the general purpose? If you find a question on asking the general purpose of a board meeting, or what is the agenda of a board meeting? So the answers are one, appointment, of managing director, appointment of managing director, appointment of managing director. Two, we can say appointment of a company secretary, appointment of a company secretary, appointment of a company secretary. The third one, we can say, recommending payment of dividends, recommending, recommending payments of dividends, payment of dividends, recommending payments of dividends, the other one, recommending bonus issue, recommending bonus issue. I hope that when you see the word bonus issue, from your knowledge of company law, and also for those of us take meetings and financial markets, we discuss the concept of bonus issue, that you are issuing shares at a free charge to the existing shareholders. That is what we call the bonus issue. The other one, you can say, exercise borrowing powers. Exercise borrowing powers of a company. Borrowing powers of a company. And then payment. Payment of interim dividends payment of interim dividends, the payment of interim dividends. Now, from that, we can ask ourselves one of the questions, one of the question in your past papers to outline, outline five statutory duties of a director, five statutory duties of a director. It is in your paper, the corporate governance, the examiner has asked that question, the statutory duties of a director. Now, important to note that uh, when you talk of the duties of a director, we say they are categorized into two, that is the common law and the statutory duties. When you talk of the common law, their duties of a director as was established in the common law cases or the English court cases. The main case which we discuss in company law is known as the 
RCT equitable fire insurance case. The RCT equitable fire insurance case is the one that we discuss on matters on common law duties. But the common question in corporate governance is what are the statutory duties? In other words, what are the duties of a directors as stated in the Companies Act 2015? So the statutory duties of a directors, they can also be asked as what are some of outlining the duties of a directors as enshrined in the Companies Act 2015? So they are found in section 142 to section 147, which we can briefly talk of them. One, duty to act within powers. Duty to act within powers. Duty to act within powers. The second one, the duty to promote success of the company. Duty to promote success of the company, success of the company, duty to promote success of the company, the third one, duty to exercise independent judgment, duty to exercise independent judgment, duty to exercise independent judgment, the fourth one, duty to exercise the reasonable care, skills, and diligence. Duty to exercise reasonable care, skills, and due diligence and due diligence. The fifth one, the duty to avoid conflict of interest, duty to avoid conflict of interest, duty to avoid conflict of interest, the duty to avoid conflict of interest. You can also add the sixth one, the duty not to accept, the duty not to accept, duty not to accept benefits from third parties, duty not to accept benefits from third parties. Under common law, I want you to go and try in your, at your own time, question or assignment, you can go and try at your own time, still relating to the duties of a director, outline or describe, describe three principles, describe three principles, derived from the case, from the case of recity, RCT equitable fire insurance case, fire insurance case 1925, six months. So there are three, there are three principles. They relate to, uh, actually the examiner will tell you in relation to company directors, in relation to company directors, describe three principles derived from the case of recity equitable fire insurance case. The recity equitable fire insurance case. I also want you to also try the, uh, another question on what we have uh, discussed. It is in your past papers, you can write. It has been argued can write this question. It has been argued that non-executive directors, so these are revision questions that I want you to try. It has been argued that non-executive directors are ineffective in the organization. Non-executive directors, non-executive directors are ineffective 
they are ineffective. The word is that one, ineffective. in their organizations outline six possible causes of inefficiencies outline six possible causes of the inefficiencies outline six possible causes of the inefficiencies meaning when you see that question i want you to answer using the the question is just basically asking you that these non-executive directors they have not met their qualifications. They have not met their qualifications. So in other words, the examiner is asking you in that question, why the non-executive uh, non directors may be ineffective? It's because the directors do not meet the attributes or the characteristics. So maybe one, the directors have a conflict of interest. So this question is basically asking the attributes or the characteristics of non-executive directors. Because if the non-executive directors do not meet their qualifications or they do not meet their characteristics, then obviously they will be ineffective. Then obviously they will be ineffective. Then the last one, the last one, explain five benefits, explain five benefits, that may accrue to an organization, that may accrue to an organization, that may accrue to an organization, due to a well diversified, due to a well diversified board of directors, due to a well diversified board of directors due to a well diversified board of directors so that is uh, where i want us to stop for today if you are interested to join our classes you can whatsapp this number 0759275981 and you can be assisted we offer uh, the courses on the CS courses, 